you're listening to Yo Quiero Dinero, a personal finance podcast for the modern Latina. I'm your host, Janice Torres Rodriguez, and I'm here to help you be poderosa with your dinero. I'm an engineer, a blogger, and an entrepreneur that built a $50,000 side hustle, and I'm obsessed with all things personal finance. On this show, we're going to talk about how to make dinero, how to keep your dinero, and how to make it grow. Are you ready? Vámonos. Hola, mi gente. Welcome back to another episode of Yo Quiero Dinero, the podcast. This is your host, Janice, and today's episode is about how to build wealth with real estate investing. We're going to be talking to Oscar and Germán Buendía, also known as the REI Brothers. Oscar and Germán are both active duty military as well as co-founders of two companies, REI Brothers and Good Day Capital. REI Brothers is their social media outreach and education platform where they showcase their podcast, blog, and projects. Good Day Capital is their real estate investing firm for the purpose of syndicating apartment buildings. In this episode, we're going to find out all about Oscar and Herman's journey to real estate investing, what actually got them interested, and how now they are using this tool to build wealth for themselves and their families. Let's get into today's episode. You take care of your body by exercising, eating right, and getting enough sleep. But are you doing the same for your mind? On this podcast, we're always talking about mindset and mental health as the foundation for financial wellness. So we're super proud to partner with BetterHelp to get you access to professional, affordable therapy right at your fingertips. Even with health insurance coverage, traditional therapy costs over $100 per session. And that's if you can even get an appointment. Online counseling is an effective, convenient, and affordable way to get help with many issues. You can chat with your therapist at your convenience in whatever mode you're most comfortable with. Just take a short quiz and get personally matched with one of BetterHelp's professional, licensed, and experienced counselors and get the support and guidance you need to start making a change. As a reminder, online therapy is not suitable for someone who's suffering from a severe mental health condition that makes them a danger to themselves or others. Download the BetterHelp app today and get started with 10% off exclusively for Yo Quiero Dinero podcast listeners. Just use the discount code DINERO, that's D-I-N-E-R-O, and you can get 10% off your first month. You can also go to betterhelp.com slash DINERO for the same offer. BetterHelp, affordable, private, online counseling, anytime, anywhere. All right. Thank you for being on the podcast. We actually have two guests today. They are known as the REI Brothers on Instagram. And so Oscar and Herman, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. So why don't you guys go ahead and start off by introducing yourselves. Oscar, you can go first. Okay. So uh, my name is uh, Oscar Buendia and um, been in the military for about 13 years. Um, Financially, you know, I... I'm a real estate investor. That is my is my thing. Um, I've been doing that for five years actively. Before that, I was more educationally. Um, I have a passion for uh, helping others uh, at least get their, their finances straight to then invest. Um, let's see. And I'm Colombian. <laughs> I was born in Colombia. Grew mm-hmm. up in New Jersey. Uh, and I do real estate investing with my uh, older brother, German. I'll pass it along to you. Uh, hi, Janice. Uh, thank you for having us. And uh, my name is German Buendia. I'm in, uh, I'm in the Marine Corps for 19 years. I am retiring soon. Uh, I am a, a real estate investor as well as my brother. We've been doing this for combined uh, between the two, the two of us about uh, over 10 years. And uh, we uh, are focused on multifamily right now in uh in tampa florida and we're very excited to be in your show wow that's so exciting so you guys actually grew up in new jersey so did i so where did you grow up in plainfield new jersey no way i literally grew up in elizabeth and i lived in scotch plains before i moved to um i'm in the tampa bay area now in florida so it's like full circle how cool awesome awesome and i'm moving to tampa florida uh hopefully by the end of the year Oh my gosh, that is so awesome! You're gonna love it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I used to I used to live there about seven, eight years ago. Uh, I loved it. That's why I'm moving back there. Retired in Florida. 
Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so we have so much to unpack. First of all, what inspired both of you to go into the military? Well, I went before my brother. Actually, I'm the eldest in the family. Uh, what inspired me? Uh, I don't know. I think uh, boredom. I <laughs> yeah. I, w- I went to college. Uh, I discovered really, really early in my college uh, time that it wasn't for me, at least at the time when I went. Mm. Um, I was. Uh, I always wanted to to travel the world, um, and when I discovered the Marine Corps, because I didn't know anything about the military, I never ever in my entire life thought about being in the military. Actually, I was scared of it. Um, and then I kind of saw I saw this show on, <laughs> on on TV back then. It was like Discovery Channel or something about a boot camp. And I was like, you know what? That seems kind of cool. Uh, I want to go try it. And uh, almost 20 years later, here I am. <laughs> so, yeah, that's wow. what it was. That's amazing. So, Oscar, did you basically, like, follow in your big brother's footsteps? Or, like, did you have a different reason to go? So, yeah, I, I think initially um, I I was looking for something to do right after uh, high school. I wasn't sure what I could do. I didn't really do as good as I wanted in high school so then I I I said well let me let me try the military and then you know initially I tried I was thinking of going into the the marines too and my brother said no don't do that (laughs) and then I went uh he said go air force and navy and then I I said let me try to do air force so I went in that way and I'm I'm thankful I did uh just a different kind of environment and uh, I was really really blessed that I could go that route that's awesome. So I think that's a really common story for a lot of Latinos. Like the military provides opportunities that I think like me as a kind of a spoiled, like first generation kid that grew up in the U.S. Like I didn't really even think about going to the military. Like my dad, he was in the Navy and he always spoke about like just the ability that the Navy gave him to like learn all these skills that still to this day, like he's a computer programmer and he, that foundation of education came from the Navy. And he always spoke so highly of it that I think I just always took for granted, like how life-changing that experience was for him because he was able to leave Puerto Rico and, you know, come to the United States and and live like this amazing life. And a lot of the foundation for that was, was thanks to the military. So Shout out to all of our military listeners. Like, you guys are the real deal. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, so let me, let me <laughs> add on to that because one, one of the things that I, I researched before joining, like, I, I knew I wanted to do something in my life, but I didn't know what. But I started looking at several successful people that I admired at the time as far as financially. Um, and a lot of them had served a little bit in the military or there had been immigrants who had sped up their their process in or their status i would say in the fact that they had joined the military and that set up a good foundation for for the next generation and so forth Mm. so like you said it can set a very good good base and foundation you just gotta know you know what job and how to how to really get into it Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious, like, you know, you guys are out here in the world, you're investors, you're teaching people about money. So what was your relationship like with money growing up? Did you come from a family that like talked about money? Like, what was that whole thing like for you guys? No, not necessarily. (laughs) Money was always scarce. Uh, We live a a pretty, uh, or from my perspective, we live a pretty um, uh, healthy and happy childhood uh, our family was really tied together but i think we grew up just like most of the people that grows up uh one always with the belief is like hey uh we don't want to be greedy um so money wasn't a, like a, ber- a very good thing um uh we weren't very organized with money uh we were never in our family nobody was a saver you know nobody saved money uh, investing. Nobody knew anything about investing. So, uh, yeah, we didn't have any education whatsoever besides a pay your bills on time and, and, and work hard. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a very it's a common story. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's a generational thing. Our, you know, our parents, you know, that's that's the world they knew. You know, you worked and you maybe had a pension, and you know, you just that was the routine. Yeah. Right. Especially coming, you know, as as you know, we they came to this country with nothing, so their idea was just survival. <laughs> it Absolutely. wasn't investing. Yeah, that, that's such a good point. And that definitely resonates with me. I think my parents still have a hard time like accepting the fact that I pursue entrepreneurship and that I'm like, I'm, I, I, when I get bored with a job, like I will go looking for another one. Like I'm not one to really just, you know, work at the same place for like 40 years and just be comfortable. And I think that just goes against everything that they believe is important. You know, they're like so big on stability and like, being comfortable. And I'm just like, so opposite of them from that perspective. And I think it's just like that generational and the cultural difference, right? Of like how they grew up versus how we grow up. Definitely. Yeah. So I'm curious, you're you're in the military. How do you actually start getting involved with real estate? Because I, I have a hard time first understanding how you would have the time for that. And like, secondly, how you would have the exposure to that. Uh, so I, again, I was always, uh, the first step on everything. <laughs> um, and, but my brother was in, in my brother, I, I, I always tell him that he's the brains of the, of the family. Uh, I, I was always, um, involved in, in other businesses and other ventures. And so I always wanted to be an entrepreneur since I was, uh, since I was little, I just didn't know how to get into it. Cause I never had, um, that network. I never had friends that were entrepreneurs. Uh, real estate, again, wasn't something that I knew or knew anybody in it to uh, to ask questions about it. So I got into ventures. My brother um, kind of saw that in me as well. And one day uh, around 2015, he um, he got with me and he told me, hey, read this book. And when I read that book and I let my brother tell the, st the story from his perspective, um, I read that book and it just changed, changed my world. And, uh, and here we are. Hmm. So Oscar, just tell us the story of how you introduce your brother to this idea of real estate investing. Yeah. So, you know, like you mentioned that I was seeing them get into, you know, some kind of investing, um, that, that I personally was not a fan of, um, and it was more towards, um, you know, MLM, uh, mm. marketing, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and, and I didn't, I never felt comfortable with any of those. And then I, I started really educating myself come around 2012 and reading a lot of books about investing. And then I, I read rich that for that. And then from there, um, my world completely opened up as the, you know, the different quadrants of, of people in this world and the investor, the, the business type, the people that make money work for them while they're sleeping. And then the regular, you know, W2 guy, which, which is okay. If that's what you want to do, there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, this, the, these books, they, they show you, you know, they, they open up your mindset. That's really all they do. Cause they don't provide that blueprint, um, for step by step of how to do things. But they, they change your mindset. So I was like, you know, Hey bro, you know, read this book. And when you're done, let talk, let's talk about it. And yeah, he, he was hooked just like anyone else who, who reads uh, any Robert Kiyosaki book. So what is it about that book specifically that like made the light bulb go off in your head? Well, it was essentially, it was everything. Cause the story is amazing. And it's just, you know, the difference between, you know, what my parents, which they, they were not rich. So they were the, the poor parents who did not teach any of that and would always say, Hey, save money, save money. And then versus what in that book would say, Hey, you know, actually, you know, they would start talking about your savings, you know, your savings make less than 1%, even less than, you know, 0.01%, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, at times and how that is actually you're losing money just with inflation. Um, so when you put money in a savings account, that's not really helping you. Um, and, and like I said, it created that vision. I said, wow, okay, this is what people with money do. They actually go out and find things, investments that will beat inflation, that will be a savings account. 
that will grow over time and eventually when you pass it down it's not you know it's not devaluated yeah yeah i think it's such an important point because a lot of these books and even podcasts and blogs that many of us um, experience like our initial financial educations through, that's what they do, right? They trigger these ideas that we did not grow up talking about and they expose you to these ideas. So then you get curious and you start kind of diving down the rabbit hole and wanting to find out more. But if you don't even know like what's out there, how do you know what to look for? So I think that that, that definitely resonates with me. Um, because I feel like I kind of started down the same path, right? I read a Susie Orman book, Women and Money. And then I'm like, oh my God, like, what is this she's talking about? She's talking about investing. And like, I don't know any investors in my family. Um, so I need to go and find out more information. So I start listening to podcasts and connecting with people on Instagram. And like, next thing you know, I'm starting a personal finance podcast, right? But it's like, if that idea of like, your money just not being a source of stress, but actually being a tool that you can create generational wealth with, like once you start understanding that idea, it's a game changer for sure. No, absolutely. That's spot on. Yeah. And I love what you, that you mentioned MLMs because I have such a hatred for these organizations because I feel like especially they prey on people of color. They prey on Latinos. Like they prey on single mothers and stay at home mothers and it's like so predatory, but they sell people this idea that you're owning a business and you're not really owning anything. You're paying somebody to quote unquote, help you make money, which I think is a huge red flag that people need to be aware of. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's not any different than any other pyramid, which I mean, realistically speaking, a W2 job is very similar <laughs> to mm. a pyramid. We just, it's a legal pyramid. We just don't talk about it that way. But, you know, not to knock on MLM, because I do know there are some out there that that have helped people. And for some people, it works. However, the churn in MLM is real. I mean, yeah. you have to be doing some serious marketing in order to really keep people and happy. But like you said, in order to do that, it becomes almost predatory. So mm -hmm. do you want to be involved with something like that? And not to mention, if you pick a wrong one, a lot of those products aren't that great. Right. That's a good point. And, and it's not even really about the products at the end of the day. It's about you recruiting people. So exactly. is it ever really about what you're selling? I would say probably not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I'm curious if you would expand a little bit on this, uh, I think, sort of controversial concept that you just mentioned where like a W-2 is kind of a form of a pyramid scheme. What do you mean by that? Well, it's illegal. I mean, it's legal, right? So right. like when we, when you talk about like a, a normal pyramid scheme, you're talking about you have people that work that's a boss and work below you, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and and they're working. I mean, you don't see it in a normal job because everyone's compensated through the through the company, not through any upsell. But I mean that if you really if you really think about it, there's it's still a pyramid. It's right. just it's yeah. just formed in just a legal way. Just look at the word charts that HR yeah. will provide you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just that it's it's legally allowed and it's not taboo, right? So if you shift your mindset a little bit between those terms and you look at what any other MLM is doing, it's, I mean, it's still a pyramid. It's not different. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was my point there. I mean, yeah. and, and of course, a W-2 job is more stable and and you know, it's probably better, more benefits, but there are similarities very mm -hmm. clearly, but people don't like to, to admit or talk about that. Yeah. I love that. All right. So I want to dive into your real estate ventures. So like, how did you guys actually get started with your first real estate property? Uh, so, so let me, let me, let me start. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I started uh, real estate by actually, um, educating myself, reading a lot of books, podcasts. And then when I felt that I was ready, I started investing in, in flips and wholesaling, just like everybody or most people do, you know, that, uh, that, um, that stay close to it. And, and, and I would say have a lot of um, mind blocks or, or, or like low ceilings, you know, because 
you don't have the finances, you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the network. So you think that you can only do flips or um, or wholesaling. And not only that, but that's what the media sells. You know, you go to HGTV and and, <laughs> and they make it so exciting. It's like, oh my God, these people in 20 minutes, they flip a house and these get, they get all this money. Um, so that's basically how I started. And uh, and I think my, my brother did the same thing, but go ahead, Oscar. Yeah, so then I I was trying to separately from my brother at this time we were doing uh, wholesaling and other different strategies that were more, to be honest, more at at an entry level of, you know, I I'm not gonna talk bad about wholesalers, but you know it's it's an easy entryway and the demographics show it too. Like we a lot of Latinos and a lot of minorities are in it, right? And it's a very hard churn and it's a grunt job. Eventually. Uh, I did it and, you know, I did it for like about a year and, and I didn't really enjoy it. Um, I had some successes. <laughs> I had mentors and actually had a couple of deals kind of taken for me. But at the end of the day, I learned a lot and that's what I took the most out of it. And then eventually it teamed up with my brother and that's when we bought our, our large portfolio. Before that, I was doing buy and hold. So I had my own rental properties where I was, you know, investing, buying them and just collecting cash flow on my own. Um, and it was all about the numbers, um, holding it, you know, I was I'm netting about 400 after all expenses, um, capital expenditures, you name it. And, you know, that, that was my cash flow every month, $400. And it still is because I have, I have those on my own. But then I, I you know, come last year, I told to my brother, I said, hey, let's, let's expand, let's buy some stuff together. Mm-hmm. And then that's when uh, German went out to Ohio and, and we bought our our first uh, portfolio. And it was a portfolio of 20 units um, in one shot. So we, you know, we didn't, we had limited beliefs before that, you know, being one property here, one property there, uh, slowly. And then from there, I mean, all limited beliefs were gone as far as how you can leverage money and how you can buy something that is essentially bigger. Um, yeah. So it was an amazing time, amazing experience. And I'd love to share more about it. So, yeah, we're going to get into all of that. I'm just curious for anybody who doesn't know that's listening, what exactly is wholesaling? So wholesaling is essentially, um, think of, think of like a realtor, um, but, it, but you're not licensed. So essentially your your goal is to find off market deals, mark deals that are not on the on on the MLS, and then what you do is um, you talk to an owner, and the idea is that these homes are discounted, they're because they're either distressed or they need maintenance or the owners can't keep up paying payments, all sorts of reasons, right? And then once that once you reach an agreement, you put it under a contract. And then essentially you then take that to an actual buyer and you sell it to the buyer. So if you bought it, say for 50 grand at home, and then you put it on the contract for yourself and then you went to a, a another buyer and you sold it for him for 60 grand, you as the middleman now made 10 grand. Hmm. Um, and then there's other nuances that you have to do, like a double closing, make sure you do everything legally. But essentially, in the gist, I say you're a middleman who takes a cut between a seller and another buyer. Um, and sometimes people make ridiculous fees of, you know, 10K or more, 50K. I mean, wholesalers are always trying to get a good cut, mm-hmm. which which they deserve because they're doing a lot of work trying to market and reach owners. So, yeah, and, and, and that's what wholesaling is. So how do you actually find these deals if they're not on the MLS? That That's the thing. You have to either door knock or you have to <laughs> oh, wow. yeah, look for, you know, signs of a home that's distressed. Uh, you, you know, you can you can do um, pre-foreclosures, right? Mm-hmm. Search who's about to go down and before the, the bank takes it, come in and save the day. A lot of times it's, it was about you know, win-win scenario. You, you, you're trying to not, you know, they're going to lose a home. So you have to go in there and say, Hey, I'm trying to help you not have this on your record and negotiate a lesser sale, you know, or maybe it's someone that inherited properties that doesn't want them Mm. and wants to let go of them quick. 
okay, well, if you want them to go quick, how about you give me a discount, right? So, yeah, there's, and it takes a lot of work. Yeah, it does sound like a lot of work. Um, so you guys decide to team up together to buy, what is it, an apartment building? No, no, it's a, it's a portfolio. Okay. Um, total of 20, 20 uh, units is all single family and multifamily, okay. uh, one through four units. Got it. So how does that actually work? How do you purchase a portfolio of properties? German, you want to take? Yeah. Uh, well, the portfolio, we didn't know until we kind of um, stumbled into it. Uh, what I did was I went to Ohio and I tried to, I went there for like a week and I tried to network uh, as much as I could with wholesalers, with uh, realtors, brokers. I went to every meetup that I could in a week. And then uh, we stumbled across this this seller that knew that I was in town. I, I actually marketed myself and marketed that trip in Facebook and all the uh all the all the uh, groups, the real estate groups in in Facebook, and I, I just let them know, hey, I'm going to Ohio from this day to this date. I want to talk to everybody in real estate that I could. Um, so the seller of this portfolio uh, got to me through Facebook, and she told me, hey, I'm selling all my properties. I'm retiring. Uh, I don't know if you will be interested in it. At that point, um, what I did, I mean, I, I got pretty excited. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you because our goal uh, during that trip was to maybe purchase one or two houses, right? Again, mm -hmm. like my brother said, limited beliefs. We we thought that what we had in cash, uh, we could only afford maybe one or two houses, one for each, and then start from there. But then um, we we started doing the uh, the due diligence on on this portfolio she had over 300 properties that she was she was uh loading off um and then we came down to okay we can without knowing right we we i had a, a pretty good network i live in california and i had a pretty good network that was helping me with uh with the flips before so i contacted somebody that uh that i thought that she could be our partner and what she told us was I know that you can do it on your own. Uh, just let's just start doing the due diligence. And I mean, uh, out of out of nowhere, she crushed all those limited beliefs. As we started stepping uh, one step at a time, we started uh, finding out more processes, how to uh, negotiate, how to um, how to structure the deal so we could actually do it with our money. And uh, we ended up buying 13 of those uh, of those properties. Um, and that's how you stumble um, through any deal. As a matter of fact, you know, if you want to wholesale, you just got to market yourself. Hey, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I, what I'm trying to do. And you you talk to to people who are in the network, who have uh, homes, um, who uh, who are in financial situations that they might need help with their properties. And that's basically the, the same approach that I took uh, when I went to Ohio. I just I just told everybody I'm going there and this is what I'm looking for. Um, and that's how it happened. Got it. Okay. So I have so many questions. Um, the first one is why Ohio? Okay. So Ohio came across because... I kept listening to a lot of podcasts and also there was a friend of my mom she, and she was purchasing properties in Ohio at a really deep discount at the course steps. So she would go, she, she lives in, in New Jersey as well. And she would go to New Jersey, go to the courthouse when they were um, selling all these properties and she would buy properties at seven, ten thousand uh, dollars $10,000. She would go out there and flip them. And then and then sell them or put them to to rent. So I told my brothers, like, man, well, I mean, at that at that with that money, we can buy again one or two houses in a week, right? I'm mm -hmm. I'm just thinking in, in in a week time, I can come out with two. So I actually went to the core steps as well to see uh, if we could, uh, or at least the process on how we could uh, uh, process how we could purchase uh, properties there. So that's so why these are Ohio. homes that are being like foreclosed on or auctioned off or something like that. Ex exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, in in one of the things that also attracted us was the entry point, right? I mean, the the prices were relatively low. If we didn't get any any auctions or we didn't get any discount properties, we could also afford maybe one or two houses at, at thirty or or twenty thirty thousand dollars, 
and it, it, they will be paid off. There will be cash cash flowing from day one. Uh, laws in in Ohio for investors are pretty good. They're pretty um, uh, investor um, friendly, so that helps us as well. Uh, like I told you, the uh, the cash flow, uh, the price versus the uh, the the uh, the rent, uh, they make sense as well as for the uh, for the investors. The cap rates in Ohio are pretty good as well. So. So we decided to to look into Ohio, and, and and it was pretty it was pretty good it was pretty good experience. Okay, so what you're describing sounds to me like a real estate syndicate. Is that accurate? Not no. at that point. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no. That that was what well, that was a, a joint venture between him and I. A, okay. a syndication would be you you raise capital, you have investors. Um, yeah, a whole different thing. And okay. we can go into that as well. Yeah, for sure. So um, my first, my next question for you is how much money do you actually need to like participate in these types of deals? Because when I think of like buying 13, 20, whatever properties, I'm just like, okay, well, I don't have like half a million dollars in the bank. So like, how am I supposed to do this? Janice, let me tell you something. I love that. <laughs> I love that question because- of all the podcasts that we've been to, nobody asked that question. <laughs> and that was one of the limited beliefs that we had. It's like, okay, we don't have that much cash. You know, uh, I mean, we had savings and we, I mean, substantially we had, we had pretty good savings. We just didn't know what the potential of our savings. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I love your question because yeah, we didn't have, we didn't have that much. Um, and we, we pulled it off from, everywhere we could to um to find that so just to give you numbers because i'm not i'm not afraid to give you numbers is i had my my retirement account i took i had twenty dollars uh, twenty dollars sorry twenty thousand <laughs> twenty uh, around twenty five thousand dollars in cash that i just pulled from from that uh from that account that i that i was like okay again because the prices in ohio were so low that I could probably buy me one or two houses if if it was from the courthouse. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, then I could just afford one house for twenty thousand dollars, or maybe at least a down payment. Um, and that's where I started with twenty thousand uh, dollars. My brother had a, a similar amount of money, uh, but when the uh, the portfolio came out, I mean, we pulled money from everywhere because the opportunity was so huge. That uh, that I was willing to take everything that I had and put it into this portfolio. Um, so the same thing with my brother. So okay. one of the things we did was, you know, our our, our family was huge. You know, we our, our mom had some money saved, so she gave us some money. Not not gave us. We we pay, were paying her back. Um, but that was part of that. You know, she believed in us, and we at this time we didn't want to use investors which we were starting to, to attract um, just because we didn't feel comfortable doing that yet. So mm -hmm. this was still just a in-house portfolio and, you know, we're, we're provide if we provide returns, it's for our family. And if we mess up, it's on us. You know what I mean? Like, right. Our, <laughs> you our don't, money... You're not beholden to like some, some rich dude who's going to come after you with a bunch of lawyers or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, the rich dude, I'm not worried about It's It's more the people without money. Cause <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. the, the non-credit investor is usually the harder one. Um, um, people with money understand the risk, but people without money are for some reason, they get mad over a dollar. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, I mean, I, that they makes need sense. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of risk, like, how do you assess if this is a good decision? Because I think that's another thing that, like, a lot of people get caught up in. Like, am I making the right choice? Like, how do I know this is a good investment? So, what does that process look like? Well, you gotta you gotta learn the math, uh, and it takes a while to learn the math and feel comfortable with it. Where you can just do it on your head in your head. You know, at the beginning, is is very confusing. It's like going to to physics class and you're like what is going on you know so many numbers so many rules uh but the the, the actuality is, is really simple you know when you start doing the math and when you start understanding the processes and, and 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 it's really simple it's simpler than than opening any other business it's simpler than any other uh investment like on the stock market or anything like that is is for real estate is it's pretty simple uh so that's how we um we kind of mitigate it the uh, the risk on what we got into, 
uh, knowing the math and, and having the experience as well. My brother and I had some experience in it. And, um, and, and it made sense. I mean, again, it's the ratio between the, uh, the, the price that we're paying for the properties and the income that is producing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So is there like a specific ratio that you use to know that it's a good deal versus not? Well, that that's evolved big time. So, yeah. and it depends on what, what you're buying. So for example, if you are, if you're doing a regular duplex or regular residential property, there's really good calculator out there, which is the bigger pockets one. I don't like to recreate the wheel. And mm-hmm. I always tell people that is the one that is solid. I mean, it, you can't go wrong with it. And yeah, I mean, I, I want to, if, it, if it's just an individual property, I want to make at least uh, 150 after all expenses. So I want to net 150 in cash flow. There's other rules like, you know, the, the one percent rule, which is you're making one percent of what the property's worth. So if it's worth what is it, a hundred thousand, then it's you're, you're renting getting, it for a thousand dollars. You're renting it for a thousand dollars. Sort of rules like that. But then when you get into more sophisticated investments like a syndication, uh, now we're talking about you know criteria cap rate. We're talking about uh, location yeah. uh, as far as uh, the the areas. You know the asset. Uh, then we're talking about the cash on cash. We're talking about um, IRR, how long you're holding that investment, uh, and the total return on, on investment overall in a three to five year term. I mean, you should be looking at that as well in 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 a regular investment, but it's not it's not as a uh, it's not as hard to do, you know, with a smaller one that it is with a, a bigger one. Mm-hmm. So, would you guys say that you're pretty much buy and hold real estate investors at this point? Uh, yeah, I would say at this point we, well, no, I would say. I yeah, don't know. I don't know. Investors. I don't. Yeah. But I don't know if in the multifamily circle is called buy and hold anymore. It's just multifamily investors, uh, uh-huh. syndicators. Uh, but yeah, but that, but that's basically the concept is that we, we buy the properties and we hold the properties for, mm-hmm. for, yeah. for, uh, for an income. Yes. Okay. So you make this first deal and your mind is blown. Your you see these possibilities now. So like what's what's next after this first deal? Like how do you guys continue to expand your portfolios? I so, love that question too. Go ahead, Oscar. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. So that that's an amazing question. So we from there what we did, um we realized the ability to raise cap capital we realized the ability to scale to a whole different level. So from there, that's when we uh, looked into syndication. Um, and syndication is just another fancy word for crowdfunding mm. for those out there that don't understand what that means. But you as a, uh, well, as a real estate investor, if you started syndication, uh, there's different regulations, but y- this is one of the beautiful things of being a real estate investor that you don't need a license to start a real estate investing firm. It's one of the industries where the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, um, says that hey, if you're a real estate investor, you could start a firm. You don't need a li- a pro a financial license. Um, you just need to have the proper education, do it right, and don't mess up. Mm-hmm. And they have specific rules for that. So, as a as a real estate investor, we have an entry point. Um, and then the tax benefits are huge. So then from there, we decided, hey, let's look into this. This is how you actually do it right for raising capital. And we actually started to raise uh, capital uh, for other deals. We had a 24 unit under contract. This was a an apartment uh, complex, a condo complex, I guess. And then we had other two deals, 50 unit, and I think there was a 75 unit. And in one night, we raised about three hundred thousand uh, dollars. We did a, a webinar. We talked to it was just a lot of our friends, um, people that we knew, and and people that had been following kind of our journey uh, early on. And yeah, we, we raised capital. Uh, unfortunately, uh, COVID happened, mm. and a lot of those deals went away. Uh, the capital shrunk a little bit because people were more concerned. 
Um, and then from there, we decided, hey, you know what? Maybe there's a lot of things that we're missing so far. We're, we're going so 150 miles per hour. And we decided to advance our education uh, to do this 100% right for the people that we have as investor pool. So we joined an academy. Uh, it's called uh, Jake and Gino Academy. They're multifamily syndicators, owners, operators. Uh, in there, there's about a thousand people. And then, in you know, one, our knowledge blew up. Our network has grown, I mean, by a million. Um, and from there, we've raised even more capital. Now where we've been approached by kind of institutional companies that are uh, hedge funds or, or, or equity firms. And they're like, hey, if you have a deal, we can, we have investors, we can pull into your deal. And it's all about fitting the puzzle. So as of right now, we have a team of five people. Um, and we are we're looking at, you know, 50 to 150 units in, in Florida, in Tampa, mm -hmm. um, more specifically. And honestly, we're just waiting for the deals to, to start popping up. And we're starting the campaign to go directly to the owners, uh, just because COVID, the market is a little bit weird. So we're, we're kind of still looking, but we're not finding that many good deals. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that makes sense. There's a lot of uncertainty right now in, in the world. And I think, you know, that's obviously um, trickling into the real estate field as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, like these things sound quite complicated, like structuring how people get paid based on like, is it based on how much they invest? Like, how does that work? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you, 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 that's exactly it. Okay. So there's different, there's different, um, I mean, it depends on who's structuring the deal, but there's everything from a waterfall, which is depending on if you invest, let's say, a higher tier over 50K or over 100, the more you invest, the more of a percentage of the asset you get. So the more uh, distribution you get uh, from cash flow or from when you sell it or refinance it and you pull more money out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. But but the beauty of it, and we haven't even touched it, is, you know, these are investments that, you know, minorities, and, and this is this is really why I think a lot of people need to know this. And I kind of wrote it in the, in the questionnaire you asked, mm -hmm. you know, people who don't, who are not accredited investors, which don't, don't make 200K or more, in a year, um, don't have a million dollars worth of, um, that are not worth a million dollars, don't have access to a lot of these investments that are making, you know, 80% total return in, in a period of three or five years. And the reason for that is because the government protects people who are, who are not accredited investors and says, Hey, these investments are deemed way too risky. And we don't want anyone to lose money. We rather keep people happy, and that's it. So, the greatest wolf vehicles are these deals. And I'm not saying ours are the best deals, but I'm saying in general. I mean, we've seen deals where people are investing 100k, and in five years, they could be pulling out 300k, 400k. Wow. I mean, talk about building wealth, right? Right. And you and I may not have access to it unless we know the guy structuring that deal because that guy can't tell you, hey, I have a really good deal for you and you should know about it because that's against the law. The uh. government's protecting you and me from someone scamming, them, which which there are people doing that. But right. at the end of the day, we're missing so much opportunity to grow our money because stocks and bonds and all that, I mean – eight percent seven percent that's that's not bad right but it is not gonna build this generational wealth that that you hear about and that and and that's really how people are doing it syndications you know so, and not just in real estate in marijuana you name it oh wow i my mind is being blown right now okay so how the hell do you find out about these deals if they're not allowed to be publicly advertised so you need to know like a it's a syndicator. So, so that's basically you have to join like these Facebook groups and these networks and go to events and like meet people. 
Correct. Because they can't approach you to say, I have an investment. You have to be the one <laughs> for, for, for a 506B, which is what the Security Exchange Commission allows for non-accredited investors. People have to approach us to get on our investor uh, pool and for us to be like, hey, this is what we have. Yeah. We can't go out and market it. Now, if you're an accredited investor, I could advertise all day to you. Or, um, or the other side is if we have, let's say, for example, with you right now, we have a relationship, right? We talk several times. We know mm -hmm. each other from, from previous. Then I can go lawfully. I can go to you and tell you, hey, this is what, because you already know what we do and the business that we're, that we're, uh, that we're into. So we can go to you and say, hey, uh, we have this deal uh, and, and we're accepting non-accredited investors. Would you like to be on our deal? Um, yeah. But I cannot. But there has to be an established relationship. Exactly, there has to be an established relationship, and 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 I have to be able to prove it that I that we had that, that previous relationship. But I cannot go on Facebook and just or Instagram and just blast it to everybody and be like, "Hey, this is what we have. Who wants to invest with us?" So, how would you prove that relationship? Well, th there's documentation that ah. you have to provide, yeah. and and it's all. You know, just checking balances because the SEC will do an audit and they'll say, well, how do you know these non-accredited investors? And you have to show, you know, it's like a history of when you met, how long you talked. And <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's pretty. It's like pretty if you fun. were going to apply for like a marriage license for somebody who's a non-citizen, yeah, you can't it, just have it, met on the street corner and be like, yeah, we're cool. getting married. Exactly. That's <laughs> a great way to put it. I love yeah. that. I love that. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. Okay. So my next question is like, how much money do I need to get involved in a syndication? Because I feel like at, this sounds like, yeah, I got to have like $50,000, $100,000 like sitting around. Like what is realistic to get involved in these types of so deals? It, it completely depends on, on the deal. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, uh, with us, we, we initially set a minimum of 25 K. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there are other, other people who, like, for example, Grant Cardone, he's a syndicator. Um, he takes, like, a grand. <laughs> oh, gosh. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So people are getting, like, I think, like, you know, $25 returns distribution in a month. But he, I mean, he'll take, he'll take anybody's money, whatever little amount. You got 50 cents, he'll take it from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is, it's interesting, you know. But, you know, one of the big points I want to say is that, and I was trying to say it earlier is is the syndication is not just real estate. People are doing it in in all industries, in the oil industry, and it's it's startups, you name it. Um, but again, we don't. I never heard about it until I started getting involved into this world. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, and I think that's the most important point that anybody takes away from this episode. It's like you have to educate yourself on what is actually out there because there's like so many possibilities that you don't even realize but if you're not actively like seeking new information like you're not going to find this stuff exactly mm -hmm. yeah yeah one of yeah. one of the things that i tell people is like hey turn off your tv <laughs> <laughs> and 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 start asking questions that you don't ask your question that you don't ask when you're in front of the tv and and just consuming media you yeah. know if you, if you ask questions as far as like hey uh, how is it that people make money? You know, how is it that the wealthy make money? Uh, we tend to, and I, I, I talk about this a lot. We tend to criticize the the rich and the wealthy um, because you know, a the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, um, and also that a how come the wealthy or the big corporations don't pay taxes or pay minimum taxes? Mm -hmm. You know, that that's a, that's a big question that we ask as Hispanics in in people of of uh, uh, middle and low class. And instead of asking, instead of criticizing or asking that question in a sense of criticizing, why don't you ask yourself, it's like, how is it that they do it? Because they're doing it legally, you right. know? And, and, <laughs> you're seeing and, people going to jail making millions of dollars unless they're like, you know, exactly. running a Ponzi scheme or something. Exactly. And it happens. And it happens. Right. But legally, people are just like you and I who does, for example, real estate. Real estate is, is one of the those uh, um, uh uh, businesses that that you can actually uh, shelter a lot of taxes and, and mm -hmm. has immense tax benefits that people don't realize. 
you know right. so when you when you see people in real estate and they yeah they're 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 not i mean just to, just to say it on 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 simple terms yeah they're not paying taxes and it's totally legal you know right yeah yeah in one way i'll give an example in real estate you know you can defer your capital gains tax which you can't do that in any other asset at least not that i know and if someone knows <laughs> let me know because i've never heard of anything like this so you defer your capital gain gains tax and you could flip it into another real estate investment and put it in there and you could keep doing that your whole entire life and you can die and then what happens with those deferred taxes they're gone so you've essentially don't this is how ever. if you want to know how the wealthy actually get wealthy is because they go through life recycling their money mm. and then when they get to the point that they're dead and they're about to pass it down there is no taxes for them to pay because they're dead <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and now they have all these trusts and all these other entities right where it's passed on to their next generation and they might pay a little bit of tax there for you know but other than that I mean, you have a whole lifetime of compounding interest mm -hmm. in different investments have never been taxed. Yeah. So, yeah, there's ways to do this. It's a great point, y'all. Like, Jeff Bezos mm -hmm. is not paying taxes on purpose. It's not a mistake, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, and he gives us, he gives us, it's not, it's not, people might say it's, it's greed, you know? Um, but no, but the reality is it gives us the opportunity to reinvest that money. Like my brother said, recycle the money. So so people say, it's like, okay, these people are getting wealthy, you know, just real estate, talking real estate. Um, but the reality is when we buy a property, we, first of all, we're helping the communities, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because when we buy a properties, what we want to do is is beautify those properties, make them make them pretty right. so we You're can raise the You're adding value to that community. Exactly. That's one. And then we have to hire other companies to help us out um, maintaining those properties, right? Mm -hmm. So we hire in, in the, in the, uh, in the process of purchasing it, we, we hire a, a title company. So there's people, you know, getting paid out of that transaction. Then we have to maintain the property. So we have to, uh, uh, hire people to cut the grass and paint the buildings, you know, so, so we're helping the whole community. And, and when we, we get those taxes back that we paid, we're able, or that we, the, the, or the, the taxes that we defer, like my brother said, we are able to invest in more businesses, more properties, and grow. And with that growth, we're helping the, the community. So it's not greed. It's just we it helps us out investing in, in, again, giving back to the community at the end. Well, I love that sentiment because I feel so passionately about this idea of building wealth with a purpose. And mm -hmm. so when we talk about, like, creating these opportunities for ourselves, we are also creating opportunities for those around us. We can create jobs. We can change the ownership of a community to people that look like us versus, you know, who don't. So yeah. I think that's super powerful. Yeah. You know, I'm so glad that you just mentioned that because I was actually going to bring it up. You know, when we, when we started in this journey, we started seeing who were the people that were doing this and the, I would say about 98% don't look like us, mm -hmm. don't speak Spanish, very few minorities, you know, and you, people are going to work with people that they can relate, right? So right. the entry is already harder. Um, but you know, you, it, the hustle is there, you make it happen. And, and we've been able to meet some amazing people. But also, we need more, we talk about diversity, right? We need diversity in all kinds of groups. And when we talk about like affordable housing and we talk about rent control and this or that, if you come from areas like, like we did, we, we rented all our life growing up and mm -hmm. we lived in, in dirty apartments that no one took care of, no one cared about. And, and now that's something we talk about with my brother. Hey, when we get to this point, you know, let, let's, not just look at raising rents, but let's look at how we can cut expenses from our operations and then still provide a good return to investors, but not have to raise rents mm -hmm. on on the tenants, you right. know, because at the end of the day, 
is we've we've been there, right? Or maybe provided, you know, I would love to do like a, a an educational program for our tenants to be like, hey, this is how you budget, this is how you do finances. Let me help you get out of an apartment and purchase a home, mm-hmm. like because I know that would attract people too. The next person would rent right away. What person wouldn't want to rent from someone that is helping them also level up, right? Right. So. So, you know, we need more people to realize that there's more than just the W-2 jobs that you can go out there and, and, and do these investments as well and, and own apartment buildings, own a community. You can do that. And we need that. Absolutely. Need to, like you said, we need to start changing the face of who owns our communities and also take advantage of that wealth building. I love that. I am so here for all of that. Okay. Um, So I'm curious what your thoughts are on the benefits of leveraging multifamily real estate versus like single family homes. Because I feel like a lot of us that think about kind of that first foray into real estate investing, we think, you know, I'm going to buy some single family homes and I'm just going to, you know, rent them out and make a couple thousand dollars a month and that's it. But what is the power of actually leveraging multifamily real estate? Like, what is the benefit? Go ahead, Oscar. No, go ahead. (laughs) So, you know, there's one is time, right? So, I mean, residential takes, actually it takes the same effort for both, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to, use your time i would i want to maximize it and that's what we realized like hey like for me to set up to buy a a multifamily a small residential multifamily four units and below i'm going to put effort into it but i could put the same effort into organizing an actual business and growing it uh, because we had someone to- tell us from the beginning hey look you know, buying, buying residential is like, you're just working for yourself. You're being a, a normal, uh, mom and pop owner of a store, right? You start going into buying apartment buildings or multifamily or hotels, whatever that commercial asset you decide to do, you're now becoming an actual business where you're going to have to hire CPA. You're going to have to hire a team. You're going to have that property management. You're creating jobs mm-hmm. and you're creating an actual system there. And, and that for, for, for those of you who want, who want to be entrepreneurs, you, you know, that's, that's a solid way to do it. Don't get me wrong. The, the buy and hold in the individual homes is great. Um, but for us, that's what attracted us. We, we see as, you know, real generational wealth. I, I see us in 10 to 15 years having an actual firm where we have investor pool and and we can turn it into a, an equity fund and we can now support other investors by their large assets. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, everyone has their level of risk and the level of tolerance and it's okay. So and also way you, you'll feel comfortable. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. And also, also goals. I mean, uh, we, my brother and I, we're very, uh, we have huge goals and we've always had big dreams. You know, we were always curious about how far we could get. Um, some people like, like small and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but when it comes to, to scaling is, is more difficult to scale when you go from one house to another house is also, also more difficult and, and this everything that my brother said it is is con- uh, contraintuitive uh, because it's actually it takes more effort and it's more difficult to manage single uh, small properties here and there than to actually uh, get a, a commercial building and manage that building um, it takes it takes way more effort and we're proof of that you know we have those assets in um, in yeah so we know That makes sense to me because I feel like, you know, even in the sense of the risk of a vacancy with a single family home versus, you know, a couple vacancies in a multi-unit apartment building, like if your one tenant in your single family house leaves or stops paying the rent, then you're responsible for all of that money. Like, So when you're relying on a bigger pool of tenants, like you can manage the risk, especially in situations like right now, 
when there's a lot of landlords that are like dealing with, and even like Airbnb hosts that they're dealing with, like not being able to pay their mortgages because their tenants walked out or they lost their jobs or something crazy happened, you know? Yes, exactly. And in real estate, the risk is diversified by the more units you have. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you hit your spot on. I mean, most units don't go below 85%. Um, and, that, and that's, that's solid. But another big thing is financing. Mm. I didn't mention before, but for example, in residential, uh, individually, you can go up to probably 10 properties um, before you can't get any more loans. Mm. Before, you know, banks are saying, hey, you have too much debt personally, and mm -hmm. I can't give you a loan to buy another home. Yeah. And then in commercial, it's so it's completely backwards <laughs> and because they're not vetting you. They're vetting the asset that you bring in to get funded. So mm. a bank will say, oh, wow, this, you know, you have a, a, a debt service ratio of, of 1.5, which means that after, after, every, uh, after everything, you can cover the mortgage payment 1.5 times. So mm -hmm. you have enough to pay and some for savings, right? Yeah. So then the bank is like, this is a good deal. You're making good cash flow. I can fund it for you. Okay. Oh, but you don't have the, the track record to do this for a hundred unit. Okay. We'll find someone that can come into the deal with you. And that's what, what we're doing. We have people that are high net worth who can come in. They get a portion of the, of the profits, but they sign off for us and they vet the deal and they make sure everything's good because they have experience doing this. And the bank is, yeah, okay, we'll give you. And you know what they give us? 3%. 3% uh, APR. Wow. Yeah. So commercial, you know, is significantly more attractive. I mean, even now, I think there's some that I've seen that are two point something. Um, just because the banks see this as one of the best asset classes to fund. They don't see that much risk. It's all about risk to the bank. I mean, it makes sense to me. Like people are always going to need somewhere to live. So <laughs> I don't see a world where like a real estate investor just becomes obsolete. Uh, oh, yeah. No. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one other thing that we haven't touched on yet is that it sounds to me like the more that you actually like scale, the more real estate actually becomes a true passive investment where when I'm thinking of like a traditional single family home investor, like if you're doing all of this stuff, you're the property manager and you're the leasing agent and you're the super like that's a lot of active labor to be making money. Um, and I think that's what turns a lot of people off about traditional real estate investing because it's like, yo, I'm going to work a nine to five and then I got to go and like deal with like broken toilets and all this shit. I don't have time for this. Yep. But when you actually scale like your real estate, you can pay everybody to do this stuff for you. So I'm exactly. you can buy the cost. Yes. And, yep. and, and, and it, in reality, it's not, it's not passive at all unless you are the passive investor, you know, mm -hmm. where, where you invest your money and then they, they invest in, in people like us, where we are the, uh, the asset managers, right? We manage that money. We manage the properties. We manage, but that's what we want to do, right? Um, mm -hmm. But then, yeah, you can you can if you want to do passively, where well, you find a, a, a asset manager just like us, and you invest your money, and then you get your paycheck uh, every distribution date. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, I, that word passive, you know, has become such a, a buzzword. Yeah, because has. like you like you just said, you know, it, it's not really passive, uh -huh. and you know, I, I feel like people are throwing that word out there so much. And it's like, it, it's a myth yeah. because for something to become truly passive, there comes a lot of work yeah. right. for it. Like a lot. You have to set up foundations. You have to set up systems. You have to set up a business. Yeah. Um, and that's why I say residential, when you're doing it that one way, it becomes more of a mom and pop. So mm -hmm. if you're, you have to be present to actually make sure it is is working correctly when you scale up to a point that we're thinking about and we're working on you should have so many systems in place that if you go on a vacation you have a number two number three number four number five guy that's ready to step in for you and take care of whatever because they're also partners right yeah. or, or that you have a property management team that you don't have to worry about and even now we have our property manager 
who is the one that actually manages our portfolio. Mm-hmm. We just manage our property manager and we make sure he meets certain um, performance metrics that we want him to hit every so often. And it's just being smart about it uh, and making sure that, you know, you are managing someone correctly. I mean, it is really not as, as hard as people think, but it, it takes work until you can get it to be truly passive. Absolutely. And I would say that about most income streams for sure. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I'm curious, what advice would you give to somebody who's ready to start building wealth with, with real estate and does they have no idea where to start? Oof. Well, you go well I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be specific to your audience and for the Latinos, right? Yes. Uh, one is to, to change the mindset. Uh, there's so many opportunities out there, uh, even for Latinos, right? We talk about uh, our color and our people, uh, but, but the reality is that once you become that, that person that adds value to the society and to a community just like us, like the, the ones that we're involved to real estate, um, there's people out there that we probably see as people that would never help us land in a hand. You know, uh, we have people out there that we are surprised that are contacting us and in in telling us, "Hey, we we love what you guys are doing. Uh, we love all the action that you guys are taking, all the value that you uh, provide to the community. That we want to invest with you guys. Just let us know how, how we can help you out, and let us know when we find a deal for you. Uh, when you find a deal, and we'll invest for you guys. So." For uh, specifically for the Latino communities, right, and for for your audience, is change your mindset and start seeing the opportunities that this country, actually the the entire world, uh, has to offer. You know, uh, mm-hmm. educate your, educate yourself in whatever asset that you want to invest, especially in real estate. Start uh, learning the language. Uh, start listening to podcasts, uh, read books. Um, if you don't read books, audibles are are excellent for that. Um, but stop focusing on all the negativity that is going on right now because there's plenty of that and it's going to be always uh, plenty of neg- negativity. Turn your head around and you're going to see a different world. Uh, so that's that's my advice for, for everybody out there that wants to get into any type of business, any type of opportunities. Uh, but real estate, start learning the language and, uh, and start getting involved in, in this type of communities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I man, I love what my brother said. You know, to my Latinos out there, you know, I would say is, you know, and I with my brother just said the mindset, right? I mean, we are some of the hardest working people that are out there. And, you know, a lot, a lot of our, our parents or, or us individually, we didn't come here just to to be another worker bee like we work so hard that we need to learn how to shift that work into how to work strategically and with our mind Mm -hmm. Um, and what that means is that the jobs that you see day to day aren't the only jobs available you don't need to just follow the route of college you don't need to go end up being the local mechanic (laughs) like all my friends are mechanics yeah i don't know (laughs) yeah so you don't need to to do that, there, there's more out there, and the only way to do it is sometimes reaching out to a new circle and finding out what they're doing, how they're doing it. You know, I, I remember when I joined ROTC to join the military, and those of my very first exposure to large, you know, investments of like apartments. And my friend's uh, dad, you know, we became friends because I was becoming an officer in the Air Force. And my, my group of, of friends, I started noticing were a little bit different. And his dad owned a, a like 50 unit apartment building in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And they were Italian. And he would he started talking to us and talking to me about um, investing. And, you know, hey, you guys should go do real estate. And he was a doctor. And that was my first, and at the time, I, I mean, I was still, I think I was like 19, 20. I didn't, I didn't really take much from it because I didn't know what he was talking about. It was like a different language. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it's, it's up to you to understand that when people that are successful are telling you to pay attention to something, 
that you should pay attention to it. <laughs> I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. You know, because they're telling it to you for a reason. They're throwing you a nugget in your mind at that moment. You might not know what they're talking about, and that's okay because it's something completely new. So you're like, "What is he talking about? How is it? How could I even do that?" Right. And then years later, once I started really, I, I told my brother this. I was like, "Wow, this is what like this guy would talk to me about." And he he now owns a whole bunch of properties, and my my, you know, my friend he owns individual properties too. And you know, it's just you got to learn how to pick people's brain and and listen, hold on to it. I love that, and it reminds me so much of like the personal finance community on Instagram. I feel like you know it is a place where like a lot of people just come to find like minded people who are talking about money and building wealth and and mm-hmm. educating each other and i think that's that's so important right you have to find your tribe because you're not going to learn anything new hanging out with the same people all the time yep yeah all right <laughs> all right so i'm curious what is your money mantra my, so money, money. Nick, mine is, you know, save to, to invest. I mean, do it right. And then save to invest. If, if you save just to save, you're gonna, you're gonna lose money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same, same thing here. And I learned that since I started in real estate, I just want to save because I want to invest and I know it's gonna grow. I love that. Okay, I have one more question for you. Um, obviously, there's not always like there's the the fun side of real estate and then there's like the not so fun scary side. So can you guys share like a setback or a horror story that you've encountered uh, along your journey and how did you manage it? A horror story? I don't want to talk about horrors. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. There's there's a lot. Okay, let me let, let me put it out there, right? And oh my god, I. I I, I love soccer, right? And I want to put it this way because people hear horror stories like, well, how come you keep doing it? Um, <laughs> and, and I keep telling, I, I compare uh, soccer with real estate a lot, right? Or, or any sport, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, if you're passionate to something, um, you can go and play your sport one day and you can, somebody can break your leg, Right. And you're taken to a hospital, you break your leg, and you want to go play that game again over and over again. So it doesn't matter how scary it is, you want to go play it. Uh, same mm-hmm. thing with, with real estate. I mean, I've, I've, I've lost so much money. I've lost uh, friendships or what I thought was friendships. Um, people that, that stab you in the back. Um, we, we With this actual portfolio... Uh, something that was really scary was the coronavirus. Mm. There was so much uncertainty that we were like, okay, what happened is if our tenants stop paying rent? Uh, we were going through a cycle of um, repositioning the, uh, the the asset, which means that we're trying to to fix the, the houses and we're trying to raise the rents. We're trying to get contracts, uh, everything set up so we can either refinance it or sell the, the portfolio. And then coronavirus hit us, and it just changed everything around, right? Um, and we had some some type of experience, but not experience at that level uh, that it was actually scary. It was truly scary. Um, and fear is one of those things that you make up in, in, in your mind. You you start thinking about what if, what if, what if. Well, in the reality is not that nothing happened. And our asset kept performing um actually better than other assets and other people that we were talking to because everybody was paying rents and we had some uh, section eight tenants that uh, we were getting, they, they were getting their rents from the government. So, um, so we, we went through this uh, crazy and, and, and freaky moment where we were about to go under the bed and we're like, Oh my God, whatever happens, <laughs> let's just, let it happen right now because it's going to happen. But the reality is that nothing happened. So yeah. it was, it was a scary moment, but as long as you keep, you know, going and and don't freak about it, uh, you'll be fine. You mm-hmm. know, I, I've learned that. So that was a scary moment for me. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, that that was. Uh, I think that was same thing. Scary. Just you know, hey, this is a black swan event. You you just don't know what's gonna happen. Right. But I think something that that was just different. Um, you know, good and bad. You know, as you start going in this journey and people start to know you, there's obviously 
I was, uh, I'm still so surprised at the good side of how many people approach us and just provide support, you know, like, Hey, like we love what you're doing. If there's any way I can help, let me help and let me, you know, grow with you guys. And we're always open to talk to people, but then on the flip side, you know, there's always people who, <laughs> you know, are, are really mean about things and just like pessimistic. And, you know, we, we've had some encounters with, I guess, uh, social media influencers who, who are, who are jerks. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we, our goal is not to be social media influencers. That's yeah. not what we want to do. But, you know, in order to show people what we're doing, we need to show it on social media. Of course. That's the way you do it, you know? <laughs> so then you get some people that are really like intense and they're just kind of mean about, you know, maybe we're stepping into their boundary or so. And mm. that's not what it is, right? That's not what our intention, that's not our goal. But, you know, that really turned me off from, from a lot of people because I, I, I mean, I've, I like social media. I like talking to people, but I've never been the kind that's like, you know, Hey, get off my social media. <laughs> it's just weird to see how people uh, kind of change when, when they feel a little, I guess, threatened or. or just, I think that's what it is. It sounds to me like you guys are doing everything right and you're getting attention and there's just some people that can't handle it, which tells me just keep doing what you're doing because you're doing something right if you're bothering people <laughs> yeah that, no that, yeah. that was a that was a moment because we're not like that right we were very friendly we like to collaborate with everybody yeah. help everybody out and then you get the people that are trying to shut you off and and it, it kind of hurts and it kind of hurt us you know uh, a couple of episodes where, where we're like what what's going on man what, what do we do um, but then, yeah, I you, we were friends. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then, like you just said, you realize it's like, no, this is this is what we do. We have to do it. If we if we just pay attention to those people, we're gonna shut down ourselves. Uh, it's like, no, let's keep doing, man. Let's, let's keep what we're doing. Uh, again, refocus to the uh, the possibilities and the uh, the uh, opportunities out there. And yeah, but it, it hurts sometimes. I think that's a really good takeaway message, especially being Latinos. Like we are typically the first to be doing a lot of these things. And so it can be very easy to adopt this imposter syndrome and start feeling like you don't belong because you don't see people that look like you mm -hmm. that are doing this. And we have to fight through that because that imposter syndrome is what keeps us from inserting ourselves into these spaces where we rightfully belong. So keep going. Yep. Oh yeah. That, that's, <laughs> man, uh, that's, you put it great. I had, I had a friend who, who said that we, uh, we were slumlords and uh, <laughs> all we oh all we owned was, uh, you know, ghetto homes. Yeah. Well, you let the haters <laughs> and, uh, keep hating. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, I did. I mean, we had a talk offline. I was like, hey, man, what's going on? And I could, I could tell it's just a weird jealousy thing. But we can't let other people get to us. Yep. If you have something you want to do, just go and do it. At the end of the day, it's your life. You know, don't, don't put too much thought into it as to what people say. There's always going to be. Even family members are gonna say, "Oh, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. This is not for you. You shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. Take yeah. the safe route." But right? the reality, the reality is that there's more people out there willing to help you out and and, yeah. and proud of what you do and all the effort that you put than the people that are gonna try to shut you down. So yeah, absolutely, just keep going. I love that. And I am super proud of you guys and everything that you're doing. So for anybody that wants to find out more about you and follow your journey, where can they find you? Oh, well, any of our social medias, uh, our website is gooddaycapital.com. Um, we're really active on uh, Instagram, REI underscore brothers. Uh, and then our personal LinkedIn, uh, German Buendia and Oscar Buendia. And yeah, you, if you message us, we'll respond and we could always set up a call, talk, whatever. Um, we're always happy. We've talked to so many people now about, you know, their journey and what, they want to do it will help you too. Awesome. You guys are super inspiring. I'm so glad that you are in this space, that you're educating Latinos about all the possibilities that there are that exist with real estate investing. And I just wish y'all the best of luck. I can't wait to see what you continue to achieve in your business. And just thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Oh, and yeah, we, we really love what you're doing as well. So I appreciate it. We need, we need more people like you. Thank yeah, you. this is awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you love this episode and are thinking about real estate investing in a different way. 
I think a lot of us are kind of sold this idea that if we buy a single family home and we live in it, it'll just appreciate and we'll become millionaires. And the truth of the matter is that primary home ownership is not necessarily the key to building wealth. When it comes to using real estate to invest in, you need a totally different strategy than you would when you're looking for a home to actually live in. So I hope that this episode got your wheels turning and you start investigating all the different ways that you can invest in real estate. Be sure to check out our blog this week. We're going to be talking about real estate syndication, how it works, how to participate, and also the types of real estate investments and how you can get involved. So definitely head over to YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com and check those articles out this week. As a reminder, if you're loving the Yo Quiero Dinero podcast, please make sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share. That way, amazing listeners like you can find us too. We want everybody out here being poderosa with their money. And so if they know about us, they can start doing that too. If you don't already follow us on social media, make sure that you follow the Yo Quiero Dinero podcast on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and even TikTok. Yep, we're doing TikToks too. And don't forget to visit the Yo Quiero Dinero podcast blog where you can find episode show notes as well as personal finance articles, news about events, and more. Until next time, guys, stay inspired, stay confident, and stay poderosa. On the Yo Quiero Dinero podcast and associated entities, all information provided is for general information purposes only and does not constitute accounting, legal, tax, or other professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the content or information found here without first seeking appropriate advice from an accountant, financial planner, lawyer, or other professional. We assume no responsibility for information contained on this podcast and associated entities and disclaim all liability with respect to such information, including but not limited to any liability for errors, inaccuracies, omissions or misleading or defamatory statements. Usage of this podcast and associated content constitutes an explicit understanding and acceptance of the terms of this disclaimer.